Okay, today we're going to talk about electronics speci uh, specifically as they pertain to uh, communication systems. Now, electronics are used uh, in a lot of applications, but um, probably most frequently these days, and most importantly these days, they're used to communicate between people, between countries, between cities, etc. Uh, so we're going to discuss how those systems work and what are some of the limitations of each of the variations of those systems. So let's look at a few specific uh, terms that we need to be aware of. First, uh, bandwidth, multiplexing, modulation, and demodulation. Now bandwidth uh, is usually used kind of colloquial to describe how much um, capacity something has. That's not exactly the, uh, the definition, but it's fairly close. Um, when you think of a, a, a specific medium, how, what's the limitations of that medium? Uh, there's an acronym, POTS and PANS. Those are actually real acronyms. Um, POTS are plain old telephone service, old copper wires that are used for telephone system. PANS are pretty awesome new services like fiber optics and other, uh, uh, other options that have much higher bandwidth. Um, now, the technical definition of bandwidth, which is what you want to remember, is the difference between the upper and lower frequency limits in a signal. That is the width of the band. Okay, So it is the difference between the upper and lower frequency limits to a sig uh, signal. Multiplexing uh, is using a single medium, be it a copper wire, a, a radio frequency, a fiber optic line, to send multiple transmissions. Usually, those are uh, those signals are separated by different frequencies. That's how you get multiple um, cable channels on one cable line. You can get thousands and thousands of channels of the home shopping network and ESPN one through sixteen all on one cable line by separating those channels by frequencies. Now, modulation is what is done to modify the transmission signal usually by uh, raising dramatically the, uh, the frequency to match whatever the carrier limits are. Uh, you, certain carriers, certain mediums can only handle a range of certain frequencies. So it, it's very rare if the, um, if the signal itself matches up with those frequencies. So the frequency or the signal needs to be modulated to be sent along that, that medium. Demodulation is the reverse of that process. That is to extract the final, the, extract the signal from a carrier transmission. Okay, here's an example of, of uh, AM and PM, or AM and FM rather, uh, as radio frequencies work. You'll have a signal which is represented by the sine wave on the very top, and then the middle one is amplitude modulation. That is the uh, the amplitude of the waves is what's changing to vary the signal. With that, you have a very long range, but a very limited quality in the, uh, in the signal. The, the very bottom, exactly, the very bottom uh, is frequency modulation. That is, the frequency is adjusted uh, and, and it gets longer and shorter. Uh, so you have a much higher range of, uh, of frequencies and signal values but your, the, the distance that this can be transmitted over the air is much more limited. So that's why AM stations, radio stations, will have a very long range. Uh, usually if you're driving around outside of the city, way out the city limits, um, you'll get AM stations pretty clearly. But FM stations might be a little sketchy. Um, like you can get a lot of FM stations for Cleveland um, all the way down uh, past Medina if you're going south on 71 for example but AM stations will stay viable for a long time after that Ooh. now frequency um, frequency is uh, a uh, is the SI unit or Hertz rather is the SI unit for frequency um, and it is equal to one cycle per second so when we're talking about AC outlets uh, the frequency in the United States is 60 Hertz so it is switching back and forth between positive and negative on the hotline uh, 60 times a second now when you're talking about radio frequencies and signal and transmission frequencies typically you're going to be in the kilohertz and megahertz range um, 
So that is a thousand cycles per second or a million cycles per second. So for example, um, if your time between flashes uh, at the bottom example, I don't know how clearly you can see this on the projector. If the time between flashes is a half second, then the frequency is two hertz. Um, if it is one second between each flash, then it's going to be one hertz. And if it's, uh, let's say, two seconds between flashes, it's going to be one half hertz. Explain the principles of frequency uh, division multiplexing. Now, uh, you have ISP providers, um, which are wh what you guys are aware of are the um, are like the Comcast, the Time Warners, and the Charter and the Cox Cable ends of the spectrum. You're, you're aware of those companies. There's a lot of other companies that are ISP providers, but those consumer facing companies, they're known as the last mile company. They, they control the connection from junction boxes to your house. Okay, they don't handle the bulk of the transmission, not by a long shot. Uh, but since they're consumer facing, uh, there's the, you, the, you have a lot of consumers who have to deal with those companies and consequently a lot of those companies have terrible customer service reports because they're dealing with many millions of people. Uh, the companies that provide the internet service to those companies, they're only dealing with a few big players. So it's a lot easier for them to manage their accounts. Now if we look at how those service providers operate, they buy chunks of bandwidth. Uh, they buy chunks of bandwidth and then they uh, divide those chunks by frequency range using frequency multiplexing. Uh, multi, uh, now, telephone in modem connections uh, had connections that were 56 kilobits per second. Uh, that required a bandwidth of 56 hertz. Okay, you need one one um, you need 56 hertz to be able to transmit that many kilobits per second. Okay, you think about uh, a kilobit is a thousand bits and each second transmitting a thousand of them that's one kilobit so 56 kilohertz uh, you, you have that free frequency fluctuation to allow for that now around now well not around now around 2000 I don't know eight ish seven ish uh, when they were when they wrote this guide the the capacity between those um, those bandwidth uh, those bandwidth uh, limits were between 500 kilohertz and 2 megahertz. Now it's quite a bit more than that. Uh, 4 megahertz bits are uh, 4 megahertz connections are standard-ish. Uh, it's going much faster than that. So if you take a look at how an ISP operates, if they bought 100 megahertz of bandwidth, they would be able to support 52 megahertz uh, links among their customers, or about 1,050 kilohertz users. So they have a limited amount of bandwidth that they have to separate amongst their, um, their uh, users. Currently, and there's actually laws going through Congress to change the definition of what broadband is in the United States. Uh, currently, broadband is accepted to be any connection greater than 256 uh, kilobits per second. Now, in practical application, this is barely enough to browse the internet these days. Uh, you'll, you're certainly not going to be watching any streaming videos on a 256 kilobit connection. Okay, so they're trying to change the definition of what is considered broadband, but there's a lot of pushbacks from uh, lobbyist groups who want to keep that definition where it is because if an ISP is offering broadband connections to however many millions of people, they get they get that kind of um, recognition. Now if the, all of a sudden the bar for what is considered broadband is raised on them and they now have fewer broadband customers, then it doesn't, it's, it's, it's kind of a PR thing that they're worried about. Time division multiplexing would be to separate a signal based on um, time pulses rather than frequency division. So with frequency division multiplexing, you're allotting a range of frequencies to a specific customer. With time division multiplexing, you're allotting a range of time or a pulse, a pulse width rather, uh, to each of the individual uh, signals. Now they're encoded along, they're encoded, and then sent along a single transmission line. Now 
With this, you need to have a receiver and a transmitter that are synchronized, so the, the receiver knows what, when it's getting a certain packet. Now, copper wire, um, old copper connections, which are the most common connections you're going to have for um, signal transmission these days, they are very limited in their bandwidth capacity, and therefore they can only support um, a small number of simultaneous users. So it's not really cost effective. It's been around the longest, and there's a lot of legacy copper systems out there, um, but you'll have electrical noise on those copper signals because of induction, which is a principle that we talked about before. You have interference on copper wire links. Uh, that, therefore, the longer copper wire length, the, the slower it gets. You have more signals. So for long runs, a lot of times they will um, switch to fiber optic. Now, fi because you don't get any signal interference from, from fiber optics, from electromagnetic frequencies. Um, and then copper wires uh, require a lot more maintenance uh, than fiber optic will. When you have multiple copper lines running parallel to each other, if they're too close together, you'll have induction on the adjacent line, so you're going to get a lot of signal interference um, on copper. So I mentioned fiber optic. What is fiber optic? Basically, it's a cable made from coated glass or plastic with a thermoplastic um, uh, overcoat to both strengthen it and to prevent any light interference on those uh, on those um, those those fibers. Now, the size of fiber optics are extremely small. You have to use very specialized equipment to work with fiber optics. I've I've installed many copper connections in my lifetime. Never have I messed with fiber optics because it can actually be somewhat dangerous because you, people have gotten splinters from fiber optic glass and it's so small it, it you can you can barely see it. So you usually use special gloves when you're working with these materials and you have to be very well trained. It's very easy to screw up fiber connections. Now for fiber, um, the signal is modulated onto a carrier signal of an optical frequency rather than a radio frequency. Uh, the light um, can, can be contained within the cable because it reflects through the cable along the, the jacket. And it can travel along a very long distance of fiber with very low signal loss. Now, you take a look at the variation of, we were talking about old uh, modem lines. You had a frequency of um, 56 uh, kilohertz. Uh, optical light has a frequency variation of 360 terahertz. Therefore, it has a th theoretical um, equivalent of 1,400,000 and something thousand broadband connections at a 256 kilobit connection on a single fiber optic line. Now, typically, fiber is sent in bundles of many hundreds of fibers. Okay, so it has a very high bandwidth potential. Optical frequencies are very high, and the order of three to the ten to the times ten to the fourteenth hertz. So there's a huge band, like I just said. Okay, there's a very large bandwidth potential on fiber optic lines. Now, a block diagram for a fiber optic would look something like this: you have an electrical pulse that gets converted to a light pulse. It is then sent down the uh, the fiber line. Then at the end of the line, it is converted from light back to the electrical signal pulse, and then it's transmitted on its way, typically down a standard copper line. St. Ed's has a uh, a fiber connection here. We have a fiber backbone that runs down the length of the school, but then in each of the wiring closets, we have fiber fiber to copper connectors. So in each of those closets, it goes from a fiber signal. Um, to regular copper to get to each of the individual classrooms or to the Wi-Fi uh, signal boxes in each classroom. <coughs>